Hello there, good evening. Welcome to Look North, our top story tonight. Suffering in silence, the older people been abused by their partners and their older children. I was a hostage so that I couldn't really go out anywhere. I, I couldn't make phone calls. I wasn't allowed to do anything very much at all. It was like being in prison. A Yorkshire charity has recruited more staff to spot the signs. Also tonight, the widow of a man killed on a section of a smart motorway in South Yorkshire calls on the political parties to scrap them. The campaigner with motor neurone disease undertaking his third gruelling challenge inspired by Rob Burroughs' legacy. But darling, thank you for taking my breath. And from surveying to singing, the South Yorkshire musician who's performing at Glastonbury after losing his job two years ago. Well, in general, it's been a little bit brighter today. This was the scene in Barnsley. Plenty of sunshine when this shot was taken a few hours ago. But what about tomorrow and leading into the weekend? Join me for the detailed forecast. Hi there, first tonight we're looking at the hidden problem of older people struggling with domestic abuse in silence. The Yorkshire charity IDAS recruited its first dedicated older person support worker last year and has now expanded the team to three. It says many of the over 65s it's supporting are being abused by partners or adults' children. Here's our social affairs correspondent, Emma Glasby. I can hardly express the depths of my unhappiness. I am so tired of feeling poorly. It's almost constant. I'm living in a nightmare of silence, cold, dark, depressing. I feel as if I'm dying, fading away. Written whilst feeling trapped in an abusive relationship in North Yorkshire, the woman we're calling Sarah has left her partner for a new life. Her words are spoken by an actor to protect her identity. Behind closed doors, um, they're quite nasty. Very nasty. Mostly, in my case, verbally. But there were a couple of physical um, things. Um, they sort of somehow very cleverly get rid of all your friends so that you look back and you think, well... I was a hostage. I was a hostage so that I couldn't really go out anywhere. I, I couldn't make phone calls. Wasn't allowed to do anything very much at all. It was like being in prison. Sarah felt able to leave her partner with the help of IDAS, the independent domestic abuse service in Yorkshire. Now in a new home, she continues to receive support. When she came to me, she was very frail. If you were to see her, the before and afterwards, you wouldn't believe it was the same person. Um, she has grown so much in confidence. Her mental health has significantly improved to what it was. You know, she, she has hope now, whereas before, you know, she didn't have much left to hang on to. It is a year since IDAS recruited its first older person's domestic abuse worker. Now there are three. In England and Wales, it's estimated that in the past year, around 375,000 people over the age of 60 have experienced domestic abuse. IDAS says for the over 65s it's supporting, 51% have been abused by a partner and 41% disclosed abuse by an adult son or daughter. But the charity is concerned that many may be struggling in silence. I think it's a really untalked about issue really because we're really just finding how many people are affected and we're quite concerned about how many are hidden, isolated or may have no idea that they're being subjected to domestic abuse. Maybe that's due to old traditional mindsets about how gender roles should be, maybe it's due to traditional ideas about marriage, so it's an, it's an emerging area of research but we're certainly concerned about how few people come into our service age 65 and over. There are masses of people in that situation. They just don't see it. Or if they do, 
they're pretending that it's not happening because they learn to live with it or they think they have to learn to live with it because it weakens you. They make sure that they flatten you down so that you're just almost existing. Well, if you'd like any advice and support on domestic abuse, you can get that from the BBC Action Line. The details are on your screen now. Next night, the widow of a man killed on a smart motorway in South Yorkshire says she wants political parties to commit to scrapping smart motorways ahead of the general election. Today, Claire Mercer hung thousands of social media messages at the Rotherham Titans ground to show the support she's had for her campaign in the last two years. Tom Ingle reports. The sentiment is clear. More than 3,000 social media messages blow in the breeze at Rotherham Titans ground. They've all been received by Smart Motorways Kill campaigner Claire Mercer in the last two years. We always knew this was going to be an election year and I wanted to get across the message to the candidates of the strength of feeling of the public on smart motorways. This is our day to day. You know, people have to use motorways day in, day out for, for the mundane, normal things. So I know there's bigger issues going on in the world right now, but we have to use smart motorways every single day. And it's very important to a lot of people. Claire's life was changed forever in June 2019. Her husband, Jason, was killed when his car was stopped in what used to be the hard shoulder on the M1. A lorry ran into him. Today, that same section of motorway near Meadowhall actually has a hard shoulder again, albeit a temporary one. National highways have got one lane closed off while they install more emergency pull-in areas. It's less than a decade since the scheme was first finished. On their website, National Highways say, we have listened to drivers' concerns about being able to find a safe place to stop in an emergency on all lane-running smart motorways. But Claire wants would-be legislators to listen. We've now had, in just a five-year period, we've had four Prime Ministers say, when I get in, I will scrap smart motorways. And here we are, still having smart motorways. Rishi Sunak got rid of new smart motorways, but they weren't killing us yet. We need the ones that are in and killing us dealing with. And already, parties are showing that they're not taking it as seriously as they should. There's a reason this event is being held at Rotherham Titans ground. It's where Claire's husband, Jason, was a season ticket holder. His hat and scarf are the last items to be put on display, a poignant way to underline the messages she's received. Well, Tom joins us now. Many of the election manifestos have been published. Have any of them committed to scrapping smart motorways? Yes, they have, but I think we should pay tribute to Claire there and her campaigning power. Transport's really dropped off the agenda, I think, so far in this election campaign, and that's a really good example of how someone with a message can push it right back up there in front of everyone. Absolutely. She has said she was going to do this campaign on July the 4th, we're all going to be busy that day, so that's why she's moved it forward to today. So we spent the day asking the uh, political parties, what are their approaches towards smart motorways? The Tories say they're going to stick with their existing policy, which is no more new smart motorways, and they will continue to invest in improving the safety of original smart motorways. The Lib Dems say they don't want to support any new smart motorways, but they go a little further and say, we're going to try and invest in technology to make the existing ones better, and if we can't do that, then we will restore hard shoulders where there isn't a hard shoulder. Labour, we've asked several times today what is their policy. They had originally had a hardline policy saying we were going to scrap them all, just stick up a red cross and so there would be a hard shoulder. But they've now talked about a review to try and improve what there is and produce a new road safety strategy. That's what we know. Tom, thank you. Next tonight, a man has been charged with using threatening behaviour after objects were thrown at the Reform UK party leader Nigel Farage. The incident happened while Mr Farage was on an open-top bus campaigning in Barnsley in South Yorkshire yesterday. Police say Josh Greeley, who's 28, has been charged with using threatening, abusive, insulting words and behaviour with intent to cause fear. He's been released on bail to appear before Barnsley Magistrates Court in two weeks' time. A second man has appeared in court following the deaths of a mother and her daughter in Leeds last year. Eustina Hullboy and four-year-old Lena were hit by a car as they walked to nursery in the Sheep's Car area of the city in January last year. Today, 35-year-old Jaskamora Riat appeared in court charged with two counts of causing death by dangerous driving. 
Well, it's just four days until England kick off their Euros opener against Serbia on Sunday night. Three Lions defender John Stones, who's from Barnsley, has not been in training today because of illness. It's not specified what exactly he's suffering with. England will be hoping Stones is well enough to play come Sunday as he's a key member of the starting 11. Looking forward to it. Yorkshire divers make up nearly half of the diving squad selected for Team GB at the Paris Olympics, which starts on July the 26th. Jack Law and Anthony Harding will be competing, as well as Lois Tolson. They're all based in Leeds, while Jasmine Harper and Jordan Holden both train in Sheffield. It means five of the 11 Team B divers are from our patch. Now, taxi drivers in York say they're angry about a decision to grant Uber drivers a licence to operate in York after a six-year break. The decision was taken to award a licence at a council meeting in the city yesterday. But they say they're already struggling to make ends meet and this will just add to further compensation, uh, co competition. Uber says it's giving more opportunities for local drivers, as Abby Giola reports. Arshad has driven a taxi in York for 12 years. He's unhappy the council have voted to begin licensing Uber drivers again. The firm lost their York licence in 2017 after a data breach which affected millions of passengers and a rise in complaints about local drivers. We are quite disappointed and he has overlooked a lot of things. He has overlooked public safety, public protection. Since six years, uh, Uber's not be licensed by the York Council. Uh, Uber's been bringing the driver from uh, outside of the York. You can get an Uber in York already, but drivers are licensed by other councils. Today we saw cars from Leeds, Bradford and Calderdale. Mohammed worries the new rules will bring in too many extra drivers. We are already struggling in York. Many taxi drivers are struggling in York. We're sitting down and waiting for half an hour, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, just for five, six pound a job. And before the Uber drivers coming to York, it was a different uh, lifestyle we had. Uber say they will help boost earning opportunities for drivers, give passengers more options and support the local economy. They say all their drivers are licensed and subject to the same safety regulations as other private hire operators. Ultimately, it's passengers who'll make the difference. Will they choose local private hire and taxis or Uber? Well, it's good for the city to get used. Like, like they should do, it's a good company. Easy to get on your phone and trustworthy. probably think that Uber is a good thing, I would say. I um, think that taxis could probably evolve, I don't know, but I think it's just the next step in the taxi evolution. I've never really used Ubers because I've not really know whether to trust them or not, so I tend to stick with a registered taxi firm just for security reasons, really. York City Council say anyone with concerns about taxis working in the city should report them. Abby Jayola, BBC Look North, York. There's still no dates for when building work at a new railway station in Leeds will restart after construction work uh, left the site in March. It's three months now since work at White Rose Station ended very suddenly due to rising costs. Here's our transport correspondent, Spencey Stokes. A half-finished station. Platforms in place, lift shafts and walkways completed. But all work at the stop has stopped. Back in March, contractors walked away from the new White Rose station due to rising costs. One local councillor wants to know when work will restart. We haven't heard anything for three months and the community really needs this asset in terms of delivering the local transport that people are crying out for in this area. With all respect, this is two bits of concrete on the side of a pre-existing railway line and if we cannot find the funds or have a plan to put this in place, then what hope do we have? This scheme is being developed by a private company called Munro K. They own the adjoining business park and they've put four million pounds in. And then there's West Yorkshire Combined Authority who have put 22 million pounds in. Now it's not known how much costs have risen by or how that funding hole 
is going to be filled. Munro Kay had said they would discuss the future of the station with Look North, but have repeatedly cancelled interviews. West Yorkshire Combined Authority say they're committed to working with partners to get the station opened as soon as possible. But the delays at White Rose have fed into fears about whether other projects will go ahead in an era of rising costs. Elland in Calderdale was promised a station nearly 30 years ago. Encouraged by the prospect of commuting on the train, Richard bought a house in the town. That was in 1995. Obviously you wouldn't think it would happen overnight. And here we are, 29 years later, not able to use the station to go to work. Now I've been retired, you know, when is this project ever going to see the light of day? At Elland, the combined authorities say a contractor will be appointed soon to help take the next stage of the project forward. But campaigners here think the 2026 opening date is ambitious. The longer it's left, the more potentially the costs rise. The authorities that are planning this scheme, they really need to bang their own heads together uh, uh, and get going. Because actually, this station will massively be benefit Elland and the area around it. Two railway stations, one waiting for builders to arrive, another waiting for them to return. And until they do, trains won't stop at either Elland or White Rose. Spencer Stokes, BBC Look North. Now, Ian Flats from Green Hamilton, who was diagnosed with motor neuron disease five years ago, is about to set off on another gruelling challenge. He aims to climb seven mountains to raise as much money as possible for the Rob Burrow Centre for MND in Leeds. Rob, who wore the number seven shirt when he played for Leeds Rhinos, was a huge inspiration for Ian. I asked him if it was going to be the hardest challenge yet. Well, this one is intentionally the most difficult. I promised Rachel it would be the last one. Um, so yeah, we had to make it count. So this is seven mountains, three countries, yep. doing it in three weeks. Yep. It is quite a step up from your previous challenges, <laughs> isn't it? It is, it is. And I thought, well, we've done the 100 mile stuff. And um, when I was thinking about it, of course it had to be seven um, for Rob. And the thing I enjoy is mountains. So it came together and then it was just a matter of finding which mountain. So of course inspired by Rob Burrow, so this is going to be yeah. quite bittersweet, isn't it? I think Saturday is going to be an incredibly emotional day for all of us, yeah. Um, but hopefully as we, as we go through the journey we'll, we'll, we'll celebrate him and, and do, um, do him justice. I know he's passing last week really impacted you and your family because yeah. you were both diagnosed around the same time weren't you yeah yeah not far apart and uh, I think we've spoken about it before haven't we that he helped me so much you know and not just me but beyond the MD community everything he did was just beautiful but just on a personal level I remember how lonely I felt and alone and Rob changed that um, I don't you know I'll, I'll always be grateful for that and of course I'll always be aware that hopefully I can pass that message on to other people that there is a way of living with this disease. You uh, are living life to the full Ian, yeah. you've done Snowdon last year the 100 mile trek, you've done yeah. two marathons now yeah. for MND and this is all for a greater cause isn't it, tell us about that. It absolutely is, yeah it is. I, I, so the, the Leeds Hospital Charity, um, Rob Borough MD Centre. And, you know, we spoke about this two and a half, three years ago with Agam Jung, and Rob was 100% behind it and his family 100% behind it. And it's such an important building. And of course, it, it, it's even more important now um, that we do um, a building that's worthy of Rob's name. Um, but it is, it's so important for the M&D community um, to have a place where we can be cared for, where our families can feel that we're all being cared for, that we're getting the right level of care, the right facilities, the right environment. And it's absolutely crucial. 
Well, I know on, on Saturday you've got a whole entourage, 70 people going, so yeah. I'm really looking forward to the walk-in. I might not say that on Sunday, but I'm looking forward to you it might now. might not, yeah. It's going to be a great day. It's going to be a, fun, a fantastic day, I think. It's going to be a very wet day as well, apparently, so I'll be packing my waterproofs. Finally tonight, a building surveyor from South Yorkshire says he is living the dream after being invited to perform in two slots at Glastonbury Festival. Wow. 35-year-old Sam Sherdle from Conisborough has been to Glastonbury every year for the last two decades as a punter, but this will be the first time he'll be singing after he launched a music career just two years ago. Olivia Richwald reports. The voice is sort of like Joe Cocker, uh, Rod Stewart, Kelly Jones, Stereophonics, that kind of thing. Real time now it takes out of see new things. Really counting you to say what you see. The music, so critics have said this, not me, but they said it's like a South Yorkshire Springsteen kind of sound. Every once in a while, make you laugh. Every dream that I have, I say it's the last. Sam Shadell has been writing his own music since he was a teenager but it was 2022 before he decided to pursue music as a career. Two years ago, I got told I would be made redundant and it just came as a massive shock because I kind of built all my life around that. And then it just, it just prompted me to take a leap of faith and I was sat on all this music that I'd been writing for, for years and I just decided I'm going to do it this time. I'm, I, I built a little team around me, uh, I got a producer I got a band and I've never looked back since. I'm consciously ignoring all I do. From singing in bars and at weddings in South Yorkshire, Sam has become a popular support act, performing with Reverend and the Makers and the Two Door Cinema Club to a crowd of thousands. <laughs> now the freelance building surveyor is preparing for two slots at the Glastonbury Festival something he describes as a dream come true. It's amazing, it's, uh, it's 20 years since I first attended Glastonbury as a punter when I was 15. And yeah, to get the news of you playing two slots down there, it's just, yeah, it's phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. How are you going to feel when you step onto that stage at Glastonbury? Oh, I'll be buzzing, I'll just, yeah. I'm, I'm always buzzing, there's never any nerves, it's just excitement. What's the big dream, Sam? Where would you like to be in a year's time? I just want to see things growing. As fan base is growing, um, we're, we're managing to sell out gigs. We're playing Doncaster Leopard next month, and we've got, you know, we nearly sold that out. And I, I just want to. I'm not. I don't want to be famous or old like that. I just want to be able to maintain a career of writing and producing music, and that's it. And it, if that happens, then I've succeeded. What a brilliant story. Good luck, Sam, and enjoy that gig. A gig of a, li gig of a lifetime, isn't it, performing at Glastonbury? Uh, I've got a big gig tomorrow, Paul. What are you doing, Amy? I'm kayaking through a tunnel in Huddersfield, apparently. <laughs> you get all the best jobs, don't all you? All the best gigs. What's mm. the weather going to be like? Uh, well, it's going to be dry, unless you fall in, of course. And that'll be worth of watching. Of course I won't be falling in. Uh, anyway, I'm, under, I'm in a tunnel, so it doesn't matter what the weather's like, <laughs> does it, worth really? That'll be watching, won't it? Yeah, it'll be fine. Anyway, um, you know, Ian, fabulous guest, doing the Three Peaks. By pure yeah. coincidence, we've got Penny Gent there. I mean, he know he's doing Wernside, um, but I think that um, the view will be better than that. But there's going to be some very heavy showers around on, on Saturday. But good luck to Ian. This was taken in Home Firth, a really clear edge to the cloud. You can see the, uh, the wind's been pushing the clouds that way. Uh, so at least some of us did see some sunshine today. Keep the pictures coming in on Twitter, on Instagram and on the Weather Watcher website. So let's have a look at the headline for tomorrow. It's all changed, but unfortunately, low pressure will dominate our weather for the next few days into next week. It means that the breeze will be coming from a milder direction, a west to southwesterly, but like for tomorrow after that bright start, rain will spread in from the west, and really it's an awful looking chart again. There's the weather front bringing rain through Thursday, Thursday afternoon, Thursday evening. Then low pressure anchors itself out to the west, and it brings showers, some of which will be heavy with the risk of thunder Friday and through the weekend. Now you can see the extent of the cloud on the latest satellite picture. 
It has been uh, quite thin actually in the last few hours so many of us have actually seen a little bit of elusive sunshine. Still a lot of cloud towards the coast where there's a risk of one or two showers. Overnight it looks set to be dry with clear periods. A really cold night for mid-June. Some rural spots could be down to two or three believe it or not. Elsewhere four or five degrees Celsius. Tomorrow's high water times in Scarborough 940, Bridlington at 9.57. So a fine start, a bright start in the morning. There will be some sunshine around, but it will steadily cloud over from the west. Rain onto the Pennines shortly after lunchtime. That rain reaching the east coast by the end of the afternoon. Temperatures around 16 degrees. Thursday looks wet and windy. Friday in the weekend sunshine and scattered showers. Amy, that is the forecast. What a lovely summer we're having. Thank Indeed. you, Paul. Well, that's it from us. I will be back with the late news at half past ten. I hope you'll join us then. But from all of us for now, bye-bye. I don't sit down now. Oh, no.